Words are powerful. Sometimes a name or a phrase can trigger an instant and visceral response. Today's topic fits that description. We're talking about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. In 1994, a tomato was the first FDA-approved genetically modified food. Today, GMOs are big business. About 90% of all cotton, corn, and soybean crops are genetically modified. So what are the purported benefits and concerns of GMOs? That's up next on Our Ohio. This program is made possible thanks to the generous support from the Ohio Farm Bureau members. Producing our food, growing our economy, and making communities stronger. The Ohio Farm Bureau, forging a partnership between farmers and consumers. And by... Nationwide's family of companies has a variety of products to protect your family with our promise to be there when you need us, from city to farm. Nationwide is on your side. Funding for Our Ohio is also made possible by the generous support from Turner Farm, a working organic farm and education center in Indian Hill, Ohio and by your membership support to this public television station. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Russell. Today we're talking GMOs. Joining us is Janice Person, Online Engagement Director at Monsanto Company. Alan Armstrong, a Clark County grain farmer. Richard Stewart of Carriage House Farm. And Amelie Lipstrew, Policy Program Coordinator with the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association. Janice, let's begin. First of all, give us a little bit of, of your background and kind of where you fit into this uh, GMO discussion. Great, thanks a lot. Um, originally, I'm a city girl from Memphis, Tennessee, and now I currently work for Monsanto uh, Company, which is a company that sells seed to farmers. And we're one of the companies that's really helped lead this innovation around GMOs. Um, for most of us, we tend to think about Monsanto in the space of, say, corn and soybeans, which are obviously a big part of the farming population here in Ohio. But we also work with, uh, watermelon and tomatoes and, and a lot of things that aren't GMO. So our background as a company is really in that breeding and trying to make uh, crops better perform on a farmer's land. Hopefully a couple of these guys have seen some of that themselves. And then one piece of that is also the GMO side of things. So we also do biotech crops. All right, very good. Alan, a little bit of your background. Well, I'm Alan Armstrong. I'm a corn soybean farmer from Clark County, a fourth generation family farm, and just hoping we can keep things going for the next generation. All right, Richard? Uh, my name is Richard Stewart. I'm the manager of Carriage House Farm. It's a single family owned farm since 1855 uh, here in Hamilton County. And uh, we're a diversified farm. Uh, we, we also grow corn and soybean, uh, but we also board horses. We produce non-certified organic uh, produce and, and keep bees. Very good. Emily? It's nice to be here. Um, I'm with the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association and OFA is a grassroots coalition of about 3,000 farmer members and other members that are interested in promoting organic and sustainable agriculture. And OFA is also one of the oldest USDA accredited certified agencies. Well, we've got a good panel. Looking forward to this uh, discussion. So when we talk about genetically modified organisms, what exactly are we talking about? Janice? Thanks, I'll, I'll hop right in. Um, so a GMO, I think the buzzword kind of gets people confused at times because they've heard a lot about GMOs, but they may not know what they are. Um, recently, I saw something from the State University of New York, SUNY, where they uh, are explaining what they're doing with GMOs on chestnuts, and it was the best way of explaining it I've seen recently. 
and it, it talks about finding a novel trait for something. So typical breeding was you would look in corn to find the best trait to make corn better. Um, now with GMOs, you can look to other things. So in the Sunni case, they actually show that the, the chestnut tree in America was being threatened by a certain blight, but wheat has a resistance to that. So they could take that one little trait out of wheat put it in the chestnut tree, and it gives us a chance to save the American chestnut tree. It's the same kind of thing across different crops. Some of them are for weed control or insect protection, disease resistance. There's a full range of GMOs, so there's not just one definition. It kind of gets tough. It's a little more complicated. Uh, so Richard, when did you first hear about GMOs? Um, really kind of when we started growing the, our non-grain food crops. Uh, we always knew that the, the corn and the soybean that we were growing was glyphosate resistant, um, Roundup ready, and it allowed us to, to uh, harvest and, and, and plant and harvest in a floodplain and uh, where we had a, a massive weed crop that would put pressure on, on that crop. And it was really the only, other than running livestock on, on, on the ground, um, there was really the only availability for, for, that, for that property. Um, GMO as a discussion topic really had, didn't creep up in, in, until the last 10 years. And um, to us, it was just standard farming at that point. So, What about on your Clark County farm, Alan? Well, I mean, that's a great question because I look at it, we've been genetically modifying plants since the beginning of time. And what we're doing now is, is actually just a different method of trying to make the plants better. And we can do it with a more precise manner. You know, I, I can remember when the first glyphosate resistant bean, I heard rumors about it. I went, went two states over to see the plots and I came back and I said, man, this is going to be an important tool for our toolbox. Called my seed supplier and said, man, I want 200 units. And I'll never forget the guy said, you, you realize this is going to be a fad, <laughs> that this will never take off. The, 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 and, well, obviously he was incorrect. And, you know, it's just been, you know, it's just one more thing that we can use on our farm. And, and to me, again, genetically modified, we, we've been doing that since for 200 years. Emily, when, you, when you're with your members and, and they're out and talking about different things, what's the view of GMOs? I think there is a lot of confusion about what GMO really is and I think that frequently when people hear about modification they may think about traditional hybridization that's happened over hundreds or thousands of years to increase favorable traits and decrease less favorable traits but really the genetic engineering technology today is very different from that. We are taking genes from uh, one plant or animal and inserting them into a different plant or animal. So it is a very different process. It is something that does happen in a laboratory. It's not necessarily the same as traditional hybridization. So Richard, when, when you are looking at GMOs, mm -hmm. Has it been the farmer that's driven the technology to where we are today and where we're going to be in the future? I think it's a little, a little bit of both. Uh, ironically, we're kind of moving away from GMOs on our farm as a, as a personal decision. Um, so we look for a very simple product. It's what they call a single stack um, a seed type uh, where it has just one trait to it. And uh, that's just a resistance to a, to a herbicide. Alan, from, from your viewpoint, do you feel as someone that is using the technology that you, you're having a hand in directing where it's gonna go? Well, I think it's all customer driven to a point. And you know, on our farm, we use both GMO and non-GMO. I've traditionally raised both. So, you know, again, it's, if there's that specific trait that is needed for me to use to help boost production or take care of a problem in an environmentally sound way, that's where I make the choice to use it. Um, I tend to buy from seed companies that offer the same hybrid both in a GMO and in a non-GMO, and so I can make the decisions and compare the two to see. You know, I don't see 
this as the fix-all, be-all forever. I, I see this as just one more tool in our toolbox. And, and I want to get back to a point you made earlier about, you know, it, it is different, but the process is different. And do you think that because we can pinpoint an exact trait that that's better than, you know, I know the soybeans I raised today through conventional breeding out there in the field, no, don't even resemble what they originally were by crossing things into that. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, I call that the shotgun approach. Um, I, to me, it makes more sense if we can pinpoint exactly what we want in there that, you know, that should be a good thing. Well, I think from a consumer perspective, I mean, you're, you're getting to the heart of, I think, what people are really concerned about. Um, I think that a lot of folks feel that there isn't a scientific consensus about safety and that there are also concerns about environmental impacts with this new technology. So I think it's important to understand that a lot of the folks who are concerned about genetically engineered food are not necessarily anti-science, but they don't necessarily feel that we have that consensus and they have many concerns about health and environmental implications. If, if you don't mind if I jump in. Please. I, I think that's part of why conversations like this are so important. Um, you know, not having come from a farm background or something, I have to say some of the things you guys do on the farm, for me, at least early in my career, were really quite surprising to me, like why you would do that. It's easy to not understand how you make your choices, right? Because my choices are very different for me if I'm doing like a raised bed at home than if you're trying to grow in large scale or something, right? So um, for a lot of us, we have those kinds of questions and I think it's why this conversation is so important and, and it's part of what Monsanto is, is trying to really be actively participating, listening to people's uh, other opinions and then offering our own. I think when we get to uh, the precision that you were talking about with biotech versus the shotgun approach, you know, a lot of people don't realize Tiacente, the father of, of corn, was as big as my pinky. And, and through breeding, we've gotten it to where a corn cob is the thing that you, you know, eat at, at, uh, at 4th of July or something. So breeding has done amazing things. We need to help people understand that as well as GMOs, because I think the assumption is, is corn is all natural now, and they don't understand how breeding in plant breeding has changed the crops and what value that brings. And I just don't think they understand some of the the deep science of GMOs. And so having this conversation out more openly is really kind of critical in, in my mind. I find it interesting that here early in this discussion that both of our farmers have talked about raising both GMO yeah. and non-GMO. It just depends on what's going to work best for that particular year maybe. So are farmers in Ohio atypical when it comes to <laughs> growing? GMO or non-GMO? I, I think we're the same anywhere in the United States because even though you may not have GMO, you do have chemical crops and there's chemical farmers and non-chemical farmers and farmers in between and, and I think we're, the state of Ohio is just as diversified in how we farm, both in the size of the farms, you have big farms, small farms, everything in between, and farming methods and farming soils. I mean, every our here in Ohio, in the Ohio River Valley, our farms are completely different than central Ohio or even eastern Ohio. Yeah. Um, and, and the topography really changes what, the, what those farmers do as well. There are a number of countries around the world that ban GMOs. What are, what sets them apart? What are they seeing that, w that we haven't seen? Yeah. Or, or yeah. It's, it's interesting when you talk about banning GMOs because um, some countries ban the planting of them um, but welcome the product in as a food product and things along that line. And I, I think it gets pretty complex. So when you look at it, um, there's 
27 countries where they're planting GMOs on a regular basis. Um, a lot of people point to Europe as an area where GMOs aren't planted and, and aren't as easily accepted, but in actuality there are GMO plants in Europe and European companies are doing a lot of this work. It's just in selected countries in, in Europe. And the European Food Safety Authority has already said that it's safe. So those are other choices, just like these guys are making choices based on what's right for their field or a specific farm and things along that line. Those are the ways countries are making their own choices. But I, I think what's really important is when you look at the contributions these products can have for smallholders. I know having traveled personally to places like India, um, the, these these products are really welcomed, not only for the safety that they offer uh, for the environment and, and for food safety, but for personal health safety. Earlier today, I was talking to a friend about the difference of spraying for insecticides with a backpack sprayer versus having a biotech crop that protects from those insects. And that's truly life-changing for people. Emily, in your conversations with uh, uh, like organizations, maybe around the world, are is, is their thinking similar to the thinking of, of your organization? Well, I would like to get back to that. I think that, you know, the United States is kind of an anomaly among developed nations in the world. Um, there are over 60 countries that don't want to use genetic engineering technology, and they have, you know, reasons for doing that. I think that uh, the primary reason is they want to use the precautionary principle. You know, oftentimes there's a lot of discussion about science, um, but you know, the European Union had a group of scientists not that long ago that issued a statement basically saying that, um, saying that there's a consensus on the safety of genetic engineering food science is not correct. So I think the majority of these countries prefer to use that precautionary principle until they can be more certain. Ellen, I know in your leadership uh, role within different commodity groups here in this state, you, you have a chance to talk about uh, this subject with uh, farmers from uh, across the country, around the world. Um, what, what's the overall view of, of GMOs? The, the, the overall view of GMOs is very diverse. And when you talk about some of the countries not allowing, the farmers from those countries will say those are trade barrier issues. Those are issues the government is using to protect their particular country or their crops. So, you know, there, to me or what I am, my understanding is genetically modified has been more tested than any other foods. And I have not seen a, a credible report yet that shows that there's any safety issue with that. Now, it, I, I would really like to see it because, you know, I'm feeding my family out of the same food supply that I'm producing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I like to trust, I, I do trust science. I trust science with my health care. And, and I know there's people that, that have different views than I. And, and that's the great thing about our country. And, and you know, and the organic is, is wonderful. I, I mean, I, I think that's a fantastic, you know, availability if that's what people want to do. Mm. I, I think it's wonderful, but, you know, I, I, I haven't seen any credible evidence to, to make me concerned about what we're doing now. Um, maybe you can enlighten well, me. Well, I just like, I would like to speak to that. I think that, you know, a lot of the science that's been relied upon to prove the safety of the genetic engineering technology has been industry sponsored science. And much of the criticism that has been out there around the world has been that we haven't had enough independent peer reviewed science. Um, particularly uh, long-term longitudinal animal feeding studies that can prove the long-term safety. So I think that, you know, we talk a lot about some of the research that's been done out there. I know from, from our members and from a lot of the public perspective, they don't feel confident in it. And I, and I do have to say that, you know, I think the public deserves the right to be cautious. There have been many times throughout our history when people have been told products are safe. 
you know, we can look to DDT, asbestos, atrazine that were introduced as safe. And then years later we found out that there were considerable health implications. You know, the public has earned the right to be skeptical and I think it's the responsible thing to do. I, I think it's also important for us to, to look at things like the World Health Organization, the UN, the Vatican, um, a lot of these entities that have scientific communities and, and things have all reviewed research and, and they feel confident of the GMOs that are currently on the market and of the regulatory process to get it there. I think, um, I think the complicated testing and procedures, and granted a lot of it's industry testing like she's mentioned, but there's also a lot done in the public sector, and I know here OSU and, and some other entities in Ohio would be, I, I would assume, heavily involved in that kind of testing. Janice, from, from Monsanto's standpoint, mm -hmm. you, have, you have some of the brightest minds in the country. Uh, the scientists, in, in the, not people like me, but yes. The, the, <laughs> from the scientific community that have been working on this for years, right. continue to work on it. When there is a discussion about uh, things that um, maybe aren't positive, does that set the scientific community back a little bit? Do they look at things a little bit differently as they're moving forward? You know, I think it's it's really an interesting question because scientists tend to think a little differently than, than people like myself, <laughs> yeah. right, sometimes, right? Um, but I think through this robust conversation we're having today in the United States, our scientists have really gotten engaged in that process and they want to understand the concerns that are on the minds of, of other people. So not that it's setting the science back, but so that they can really understand it and they can help us maybe better have this dialogue so that we have the right kind of information available, um, that we're inclusive of science, but that science isn't the driver of the entire conversation. Um, of course, for us, in terms of safety, science is the driver. Um, but it doesn't mean it's the driver for everybody, right? So we need to be open to that. I will say for a scientist, they feel like once they've had all the tests, our people are so dedicated to safety. Like Alan said, they're feeding their families just like Alan is, and they would never compromise their own families and the health. Um, any more than they would compromise that of our communities. So we do feel a lot of ownership of making sure we get things right from the beginning. So are, are, are we seeing uh, an increase in super weeds or super bugs because of uh, the, the genetically modified organisms? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I'll jump in. You know, I've been farming a long time and I hear these statements about the super bugs, super weeds, and, and I chuckle. That's why part of GMO is so important because we need more tools in the toolbox because weeds adapt, plants adapt naturally, pests adapt. You know, I can remember when I started planting, I used Infro insecticide on every acre of corn, handled those bags, read the skull and crossbones on it. You know, I really didn't like doing that, but I also knew if I didn't use that, the bugs were going to eat the corn in those fields. Now with the, what well, I don't even have insecticide on my planter now. We don't even use insecticide because we can use the GMO traded seed and use it in a rotational basis that we don't even have to use that product every year. So, you know, I, I just see all these things that have improved my health. You know, I, I look at my herbicide use over the years, how it's went down. Okay, because of the genetically modified, you know, I can use glyphosate that once it hits the ground, I don't have the runoff issues. You, you brought up atrazine. We, you know, we've decreased the use of atrazine that we use on our farm, but we still use it because it's important. If it's used responsibly, there's nothing wrong with, with it that I have found. You know, we use it in no-till situations where we don't have the runoff. And if we don't have some of these other things we can use and we have to go back to the old methods that you know yeah just don't just don't seem quite as good to me now as they do now that I have a choice. Well, I'd I, like to weigh in on sure. the um, the glyphosate resistant weeds because um, I think there's no doubt that we're seeing 
uh, glyphosate resistant weeds. Mm -hmm. um, the 20 U.S. Department of Agriculture issued a report saying that in 2012, half of the farms in the United States saw weeds that were resistant to glyphosate and documented at least 14 different weed species that have that resistance. You know, in the same way that the overuse of antibiotics led to antibiotic resistant you know, superbugs, we're seeing the same kind of resistance now. And in fact, Dow Chemical recently came out with new genetically engineered crops in list, corn and soybeans, that is basically mixing glyphosate and um, 2,4-D so that those crops can be sprayed with this new chemical cocktail and in an effort to embed you know, battle the superweed problem. And I think, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, if we keep, keep doing the same thing, how can we expect different results? I mean, that's something that Einstein defined as insanity quite a while back. I, th I think it's really important for, for us to remember, though, that, that there have always been resistant weeds. I have a friend from NC State who used to tell me on his farm, because he had the hoe that you were saying Alan's probably gone out there with, over time, the hoe resistant weeds were the ones that really thrived on their farm. So, you know, yes, there's, there's a challenge around glyphosate resistance for farmers, but I also think that it's the kind of thing where that's why we need more and more tools in the toolbox. That's all the time we have for today. Our thanks to the panelists and our thanks to you for watching. This program is made possible thanks to the generous support from the Ohio Farm Bureau members, producing our food, growing our economy, and making communities stronger. The Ohio Farm Bureau, forging a partnership between farmers and consumers. And by Nationwide's family of companies has a variety of products to protect your family with our promise to be there when you need us, from city to farm. Nationwide is on your side Funding for Our Ohio is also made possible by the generous support from Turner Farm, a working organic farm and education center in Indian Hill, Ohio, and by your membership support to this public television station. Thank you.